Hey, what's going on, everybody? So a couple of days ago, I actually had the pleasure, the honor to sit down and talk with Elliot Cohen from the Boutique Blu-rays with Elliot Cohen channel about physical media, the state of physical media in 2024. So we get into a variety of topics. We talk about where it's at now, where we think it's going, where it's been in the past as well. We dive into a variety of topics. We talk about a lot of the boutique labels as well. He offers his perspective over in the UK as I do my perspective in the US. Just a nice casual conversation about physical media, the hobby that we all love collecting. And yeah, we get into some really, really good conversation. I think you're going to enjoy it. So let me quit ramble and let's get into it. So the state of physical media in 2024. Let's do it. Let's go. All right. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to the Mid-Level Media channel. I am Ken, and today I am joined by my good friends, Elliot Cohen from across the pond in the UK. What's going on, man? How you yeah, doing today? All all good yeah it's a pleasure to be chatting again with you because it's we've done this once before and it was just yeah. a great experience so well, I, I was yeah. i was talking to you before we hit the record button i was like i think the last time i've done one of these pre-recorded conversations was you i had a lot of <laughs> issues come up in the fall medical family <laughs> stuff and i haven't got around to doing one of these in a while so we're going to be talking about the state of physical media in 2024 elliot's uh, we're going to dive deep into this conversation. We're going to get inside your psyche here today and figure out exactly how you feel about oh, physical you, media in 2024. You do not want to go deep in here. <laughs> you do not. Yeah, I, I hear you. You don't want to go inside here. I, look, I am an actual insane person. I have mentioned this before on the channel. So if we go into some wild directions with this conversation, I, I warned you ahead of time, okay? Well, I think if you look at our backgrounds for both of us here, <laughs> we do we do look like insane people to the average person. We do. If somebody that didn't know anything about physical media stumbled upon our channels, I think they would think we were out of our minds. But luckily, I think most people that will watch this are probably in close to the same boat that we are, maybe even worse, maybe even yeah. worse. Um, but I'm excited to have you here, Elliot. Uh, do you want to let everybody know about your channel and what you're all about over there at Boutique Blu-rays with Elliot Cohen before we get started? Yeah, sure. So I, I, I've been running the YouTube channel for a few years now, um, and I basically just talk about collecting Blu-rays with a focus on boutique Blu-rays. So like the really collector's labels. I'm sure everyone that follows you knows knows what they are and um, i also mm -hmm. do cover some you know more mainstream 4k stuff because my my tastes are quite broad so yeah. you know i i like to appreciate all kinds of films um yeah you, you all still get a lot of the studio stuff over there mm, right yeah i just noticed yeah. it, it feels like it releases like a couple of weeks later sometimes over there yeah maybe like a and, month and later and sometimes it can even be from a, a different label or something yeah. Um, cause, cause over here we have a uh, studio canal do a lot of the big 4k releases. Yeah. Um, but before we hit record, I, I think this was a UK label, but somebody, they announced the holdovers for 4k. Mm, I, yeah, I think in the UK and it's not in the U S. Uh, so I, I, uh, anticipate an uproar over that, but uh, I'm sure Universal <laughs> yeah. will put it out on 4k later this year. Yeah. I, I saw that just before we recorded, actually, it's from a company called Dazzler. And Dazzler, okay. they, Glad they you remember tend, the name. <laughs> yeah, they, they release um, quite a lot of movies, but also a lot of television that hasn't been released on Blu-ray. So uh, a, lo a lot of British television gets released by them and some documentaries, uh, things like that. I was quite surprised to see the holdovers on 4K because I don't think they've done a 4K before. So it's a new territory. Yeah. Oh, well, I guess we'll see um, see how it turns out. That Did you see that movie? No, not yet, because it, it literally only just came out here in the UK. I know okay. you guys had it. You had it before Christmas because I believe it's. Yeah, it's I watched it on Peacock. Over yeah, here yeah. Because on streaming. Because I believe it, I've not seen it, but isn't it kind of a holiday movie? Like it's set during the holiday period. It's set during Christmas. Yeah, but it's got a real like it's set in the 70s, but it also feels like it was filmed in the 70s as well. It has a really like unique 
vibe and aesthetic to that time period. And I think it would look great on 4K. I was kind of baffled they didn't do it on 4K in the States, but it makes sense when you consider it's universal. That's their MO at this point. It's release the Blu-ray six months later. We'll do the 4K. It's, yeah. They're doing that more and more, it feels like. Uh, but yeah, everybody, I would definitely encourage to go subscribe to Elliot. If you're not already, I will be having all of his links down below in the description, his Instagram, his, uh, his YouTube, his TikTok. You're a tick. You're, you're getting on TikTok more now, aren't you? You started the TikTok up yet? <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> I keep, I keep saying I'm going to. His letterbox. Um, Are you on letterbox? I'm, I'm on letterbox. Yeah. Letterbox. Okay. Um, I don't know if I'm, I'm following not- you on letterbox or not. No, I, I mean, I don't really follow too many people with, with Letterboxd. I use it more as just a, my own yeah, diary. tool for tracking. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to stay on top of it. I, I stayed on top of it pretty good last year, but I always find myself like forgetting to log stuff for like two months and then I'll have to go back and remember what I watched and log everything real quick. Mm. <laughs> um, but yes, follow and subscribe to Elliot. All of his links will be uh, down below in the description. All right. All right, Elliot, are you, are you ready to have this, this conversation on the state of physical media in 2024? I'm, I'm ready. I'm always ready. I, I want to know right out of the gates, just what, what are your personal, not, not what everybody else is saying or talking about, but what are your personal feelings on the state of physical media right now in 2024? How do you feel about the hobby, your mental state, just what, from everything that you're seeing around you, what are you feeling right now? So uh, personally, I'd say I'm probably having the best time that I've had since I've got into films and collecting films. There's just, there's so much choice and you might even say yeah. too much choice in terms of what's being released. Um, you've got films coming to physical media for the first time ever that haven't even had DVD or VHS releases, you know, films that were considered lost you know, are coming to physical media. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a time when everyone is saying, you know, physical media is dying. And I think the old way of physical media is dying. So in, in that sense, it's more, it's changing. It's not going to go away. It's just going to change. Um, one of the worst things that's happened is it's got more expensive. That's the worst part, you know, on yeah. a personal level. I think everyone is feeling that. Um, yeah. not just, not just films. I mean, everything in society is getting more expensive. So do you, do you feel like the, the pricing and stuff is starting to take a little bit of a toll on your mental state and collecting? Are you feeling like you're missing stuff? I guess is, is what I'm saying as a result of that. I, Are you having to be I, more picky, more choosy? I, I do. I, I, I do feel like I'm missing out and, I mean, it's something I've struggled with in the past. I'm sure most collectors have, you know, the fear of missing out is a real thing and even if you feel like you've conquered it 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 creeps back in because there's always something new and shiny that you want to get um you know there's been new labels popping up that i'd love to get everything from them but it's just not uh financially feasible um like for example Mm. some, some of my friends over here they're really into vinegar syndrome um which obviously we have to import from the u.s um, but I, I'd love to subscribe to them and get their full subscription for the year. But just on top of everything else, I, I just can't can't do it right now. So I do feel like, you know, I'm missing out in that respect. Do you um, do they offer a UK subscription service? Um, I, th- I they do ship to here, so you can order from okay. them. But they they have no um, they have no U uh, UK partners. So no, no one is is releasing their stuff over here. So you have to get it direct from them. Okay. You all don't have, like over here we have, you know, like Diabolic and Orbit that kind of do the importing for us. You all don't have anything like that over there, do you? Uh, only on a much smaller level. So there's, um, there's a, a shop that I, I regularly talk about on the channel called Boutique Home Video, which I promise is not affiliated with me. It's just simply the name Boutique is is used yeah. in both of us um they import criterion discs from the us uh, kino lorba and some uh, shout factory stuff uh, but beyond that that they're, they're just the labels they they focus on um 
there's another one called uh, Film Treasures, and, and they import stuff as well. Um, but again, you know, the, the cost of importing is baked into those prices, so they, they are expensive. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Uh, I had a, a section for us to talk about pricing and stuff, so we may dive into that a little bit later on in the conversation. But um, as far as how I'm feeling about it right now, is I'm feeling, you know, generally pretty good. It's like you said, we're getting some of the best stuff that we've ever gotten uh, before ever, I feel like, in physical media. I mean, I, I only recently got into the boutique stuff probably like back in, you know, 2015, 2016. Before that, I was just buying whatever was on the shelf at the local department store, Walmarts or, you know, um, targets or wherever I would find stuff. I would just buy stuff I'd seen in the theaters, but I feel like we're getting a lot of cool stuff. And I feel like even though I I didn't collect a lot of stuff in the like 2000s and 2010s, I feel like it's maybe some of the best stuff that's ever come out on home video, uh, just in terms of like quality packaging and, and all that stuff. Everybody's just really up in their game and packaging. I feel like, recently to just make it more premium and collectible yeah because i i think as well the, the market has become more competitive so there's more yeah. labels they're all vying for the licenses first of all to release the films and then you know they want your attention they want you to get their releases so they have yeah. to kind of go next level on the packaging and the booklets and the special features limited editions etc yeah yeah, I mean, there's still some labels that uh, seemingly don't care about that kind of thing, and they just they're just like, now we're just doing standard slip covers and or no slip covers, and we're just going to put it out there. And I feel like those, as we go a little bit further into the future, may be in danger because if it becomes like a full on collector's market and people are really wanting those like premium editions and packages, I feel like those labels may suffer a bit. I like to think mm. not because again, at the end of the day, it's the quality of the movie and quality of the transfer that should matter the most, but we are getting into a more like collectible territory. I feel like with physical media where packaging really is starting to matter a lot. Yeah. I I'm sure we'll talk about second sight films, but they're a UK label that they've been around for decades since the DVD era. And it's only in the past five or six years that they started doing the limited edition, uh, rigid hard case packaging, etc. Before that, they were just releasing standard cases and they weren't one of the most popular labels. And they, they've built up a reputation now for this high quality, high packaging, etc. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, I, largely I'm feeling pretty good as far as my, my mental state on collecting right now. But I, I would... To be honest, stuff like Best Buy not selling physical media, uh, recent news of studios only putting stuff out like every two weeks, stuff like that does kind of hit me a little bit in my psyche a little bit when it comes to collecting because I'm like, I don't want the norm to go away. You know, it feels like physical media is diminishing a little bit in certain aspects. Um and that does take its toll on me a little bit, especially the Best Buy thing. And ultimately, I, I don't think some people were OK with it. And I don't think it's a good thing when anybody decides to not sell physical media anymore. I think there's a lot of reasons that could hurt physical media and be negative um, on the market. But uh, I don't know. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, most of our supermarkets in this country now don't sell discs oh, anymore. No. Yeah, you, you could go. You could go to the local local supermarket five or ten years ago and get the brand new Blu-ray release. Um, so that's that's gone away. We yeah. do luckily still have HMV, which is like the last uh, physical media shop. Uh, they're mainly a music shop, but they they do sell films and some other stuff. Yeah. And um, I just saw it today in the news, and I'm going to make a video on this tomorrow. I think that. Um, their profits doubled last year so that they were doing pretty bad financially you know they went uh, into administration at one point um and it's because of vinyl sales in particular that they've you know made they've doubled their, their profits um so it seems like in that respect in, in music at least there's still a demand for a physical product yeah. it's just i hope that translates over to film as well 
Well, diving into that a little bit, do you see, um, you know, music and books being the same as like physical movie discs as far as like, well, vinyl came back. So now physical media movies are going to come back. Do you see that as being kind of the same thing? I don't see it as being exactly the same. Um, yeah. I had I had this conversation quite recently with someone talking about comparing vinyl to Blu-ray. And obviously people love vinyl nowadays because you can hold it in your hands. You've got the artwork on the vinyl sleeve. And yeah. when you put it on, on your player, on your turntable, you can, you can watch it turn around. You can actually see, you can see where the music is coming from. Yeah. Um, Blu-ray doesn't have that aspect because once you put it in the player, you don't you don't look yeah. at the disc. Um, yeah, I, and- I was talking about this with some people a few weeks ago, and we were comparing like books having a resurgence and vinyl. And I'm like, the big difference is between a book and a movie is you're holding the book, like the holding the book, the physical copy. That's the that's half of the experience of reading the book, you know. Mm-hmm. But with the movie, once you put it in the player, you you kind of forget about it. You know, if you're not thinking about it, you could be watching on streaming or you could be watching in your player and your mind may not register the difference unless you're just really in tune with the quality, which, you know, a lot of us are that collect. But is that really a part of the, you know, experience? Mm. I think that that's what most people. Yeah, I think that's what's important about the boutique releases is because they're at least differentiating by having uh good artwork you know a lot of the boutique releases you could double as an art piece you could have it on display yeah. you know somewhere in your house um because they are great pieces of art and then you've got the books and the booklets inside so there's at least some kind of physical aspect of you know you're you're enjoying reading about the film after you've watched it so it's not yeah. solely just a um a digital thing of watching the film there is the physical uh, enjoyment of it as well yeah yeah exactly because i mean I, i'll be watching a movie and like i got conan the barbarian recently from arrow and mm. while i'm watching it i do sometimes i'll have it in my hand and i'll be looking at it and i'll be looking at the book and stuff like that while i'm watching the movie sometimes so it does feel like it's part of the experience yeah um, and i'm not gonna lie so sometimes i'll be in this room i'll just be staring at my shelves and i'll, I'll pick things off you know, as if I'm presenting it, as if I'm in the criterion closet, you know, talking about a thing, you know, it's, it's just nice yeah. to hold it. I don't know if that's just me. If, if you ever do that, where you just browse your own shelves, mm-hmm. um, but you know, it brings me a bit of enjoyment, just, you know, being able to pick something off and th- the difference, this is the main difference between, you know, streaming and digital and physical media is it, you can have so many films on Netflix but uh, your f- films can get lost amongst all the noise. You know, at least when you've got a collection, you can find your film there. You know, it's always there. Um, a, a yeah. film could, a film can come out on physical media, have a great 4K release, etc., and it can do really well. If you put that same 4K digital file on Netflix, it could absolutely sink if it's not a, a very popular title. Yeah. So in in that respect, you know, it, having them on the shelf, you know, it means a lot to me. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I agree for sure. And when you a lot of movies that are going on Netflix, they try to go for the movies that are going to get the most plays and they don't always go for the most obscure titles. I mean, some streaming services do, yeah. um, but it feels like if they don't perform, they're at risk of being taken off. Whereas I think us as physical media collectors, we almost gravitate towards the more obscure titles at this point Um, that's the stuff we're the most interested in because we've seen all the other mainstream hits the big movies um but um yeah i uh i feel like there's two sides of the physical media arguments and they're both very extreme as two sides tend to be nowadays there's the physical media is dead give it up just move into streaming and then there's the Physical media is never dying. It's going to resurge. It's going to be the biggest it's ever been. And I feel like I kind of fall in the middle of that. And I can kind of see both sides of it, but I don't go to either extreme. So that's kind of where I'm at right now with collecting. I think, I mean, we're definitely at risk. I feel like moving Mm -hmm. forward into the future, having 
a surplus of this stuff like we do now. I don't feel like we're going to continue to enjoy the riches that we are right now currently as we go five, ten years into the future. But Yeah, I, I agree. I, I do think about that as well. And, I, you know, I approach this with, um, you know, cautious optimism. You know, I'm, I'm grateful for what we have now, but I do recognize that it could very yeah. quickly go away. And, um, you know, it's it's not a million years away to think of physical media not existing. You know, yeah. you could fast forward five or ten years and you can imagine a world without it. You know, it's not yeah. it's not too far away. Um, but, but, yeah, I, I try to be I try to be optimistic and grateful for the situation now, you know try and enjoy it you know every day while we've got it like this you know and and not think too much about either the past or or the future you know just kind kind of be in the moment and just enjoy it yeah yeah i mean we're we're definitely in a moment and you know when i think about the past and the future the actual like being able to own movies like this has only really been around since what the the late 70s maybe um mm -hmm into the eighties. And I mean, the big boom and the home video boom was in the eighties and the nineties, even the early two thousands. And then it kind of diminished after that. Um, but film's been around since, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s. And so we pretty much went like 70, 80 years without being able to own movies. Like you had to go to the theaters or when you got your TV at home, you could watch movies there, but it, it, it is something that we've kind of gotten spoiled with. I feel like, over the over the past 40 years and it hasn't always we haven't always been able to own movies so i feel like we may get to a point where access will be easier with streaming but we will not be able to have the luxury of ownership of the movies because that that could go away yeah it, it is sort of miraculous when you think that we can watch all of this stuff without leaving our house and we can yeah. watch it in such amazing quality and we can watch things that were once considered lost or super super niche stuff uh you know it's 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 quite amazing when you think about it um yeah do you do you think that um because we're already pretty much we're gonna lose hundreds of movies as we go through time there's just some movies that just aren't gonna make it um are are you of the mindset that everything we should try to save everything or is it okay that some stuff just gets left behind? Um, I would say I'm more on the side of wanting to save everything. Yeah. Um, I think with, and this is a big discussion about whether art and in particular films are subjective or objective, you know, in terms of quality, you know, th there is no such thing as a, an objectively good film. Because you'll always yeah. find someone that doesn't like it, that doesn't like anything about it. Similarly, a, a film that most people might consider a bad film, you'll find people that absolutely love it. Mm -hmm. So, and, and also opinions change on films. You know, some films when they were released, they were not not as widely received as they are nowadays. Um, you know, films like The Shining when that came out, because people didn't really take to it, and then through VHS and watching it at home, people loved it more. Yeah. The um, thing and Blade Runner came out the same weekend and they both bombed. Yeah. <laughs> they I know. The ET. Or, or or even something like um It's a Wonderful Life, which is now like a, a Christmas classic. That film kind of it made a bit of a splash when it came out. And then it was only during the VHS um era in the 70s when it became a Christmas movie. Before yeah. that, people just considered it a drama with a Christmas elements. And now it is like the classic Christmas movie. It really shocked me because I I had never seen that movie before until I think 2018, 2019 when I first watched it. And I just grew up thinking it was this Christmas classic. And um, for whatever reason, I never watched it. But when I finally watched it, I was like, this is a Christmas movie? Like, mm. <laughs> there's some yeah. Christmas elements, but like the, almost no part of this movie feels Christmas to me at all. Mm -hmm. um but it's a oh, great it's like, movie i love the movie oh, it's, oh yeah it's fantastic but i th i think that's a film you can watch even when it's not christmas and yeah. you don't feel like you're you're just weird watching a christmas movie but it's, it's in, so in ingrained some... in like pop culture that that is a christmas movie and that yeah. is the christmas movie like a lot of people will put that as their number one 
Um, mm. But yeah, it's like my mind was blown when I think you know the film Hocus Pocus. I think yeah that that came out that was released in May, so in early summer. To I, time, I saw it in the, I saw it in the theaters. Yeah, yeah. So I I, I don't know if did, did it come out at that time. So, or, or maybe it was over here. It I did. remember seeing Hocus Pocus in the theaters when I was eight, and it was my it was my eighth birthday. I feel like it was like a birthday party or something. And I had some friends with me, so maybe if it came out in May, it got re released in October. Yeah, because that's when my birthday is. Because I'm October sure I was, I'm sure I was looking it up, and it came out in May to time yeah. the VHS at Halloween. Or yeah, they did like that, that a lot back then. I remember when they used to release the Halloween films. Um, in July or August, just so they could time it to that home video release. Yeah, but, but anyway, that's a tangent. I don't know how I, I don't know how we got on Hocus Pocus. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Um, but yeah, uh, getting back to film preservation. So, where do you draw the line on on films? Does it have to? Is it a legit? Does it have to be a legitimate film done by a studio? Does that deserve preservation? Because I start to think about some of these lost classics and I feel like, you know, what if somebody just shot like a home video in their garage? Does that count as a movie that needs to be preserved or does it have to have like, did it have to have like some kind of distribution at some point theatrically? Like what is a movie at this point? I think about this stuff all the time. It's like, because I've said out, I've said out loud before that I don't consider movies on streaming that are exclusive to streaming movies anymore. Because there's the risk that they could be lost forever. Hmm. And they're yeah. not guaranteed preservation. So I don't know. Yeah, that, that is an interesting, you know, philosophical question about what like what, what is, is a, a movie? legitimate movie? I could shoot a movie in my backyard today. Yeah. Probably the worst movie ever made. I mean, I do do, do our do our YouTube YouTube <laughs> uh, uh, do our YouTube videos count as movies? Because we record them yeah. and we star in them and <laughs> edit them yeah we work harder yeah. than some people work on movies i feel like I know. You know, we're yeah. doing everything ourselves yeah. promotion all of it <laughs> but yeah it's an interesting question and i mean i can only answer this personally you know from my perspective the the, the films that i would want to preserve are I, I guess films i would maybe want to see one day i know in my life i'm not going to be able to see every film ever made because there's just yeah there's just way too many films and there's films being made every day. Doesn't that suck? Cause I'd like to think I'd be able to see everything I want to, but there's going to, there's going to be some great movies that you die and you never see. I know. I know. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. It's, it's a weird one because I think actually by having that feeling that you're not going to be able to see everything in a way that makes every film viewing experience a bit more precious. Cause it's like, yeah. You don't have a limit, uh, an unlimited amount of film viewings in your life. You know, you, you do have a limited number. So, yeah. Does it make you try... feel? Does it make you feel bad or sad when you watch a movie and it, and it wasn't that great? And you're like, do you feel like you wasted your time, or do you feel like you took something from that experience that was valuable, so you wouldn't yeah. want to not watch it? Yeah, I I don't think I've ever, and and I mean this, I don't think I've ever regretted ever watching a film. I, I don't think that. I think it's always yeah. taught me something about either myself or about films and the filmmaking process and, you know, j just being able to think critically about a film. Yeah. You know, it always, it always teaches me something. Um, and in, in a way, to know I, what's I good, you have to know what's bad, right? And what doesn't right. work for you to know what, what works for you. Exactly. And, and I like it when something doesn't work for me, but it really works for someone else. And we can talk through that and talk, mm -hmm. talk about why, you know, I hate a film, but you love a certain film. Um, that's what makes it interesting to talk about films. If we literally all loved the same films and had the same thoughts about every film, I mean, it would be so it boring. Yeah. And it is, uh, it's sometimes difficult to open yourself up to that. Cause I'm kind of in that place now, but I remember like, you know, 15 years ago, I'd be like, I don't get why everybody loves these transformer movies. They're the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. And I would just get so like angry about it. I'm like, why are these the most popular movies? Um, so I feel like how I watch movies now and how I watched them then are just 
totally different. I, I just kind of just appreciate everything, even if I don't really enjoy it uh, when I watch it. And I'm open to like rewatching stuff again. Like I've, I've changed my opinion on a, a number of movies over time, I feel like. Yeah, some of my favorite films are ones that when I first watched them, I didn't really get or I sort of liked them, but didn't love them. And then on rewatching them, you know, you see more and more and, you know, you change as a person over time. So you bring your own experiences to how you view a film, you know, like, um, I mean, I'm, I'm not a parent yet, but I know a lot of people say when you become a parent and you watch a, a story that's about being a parent or about children yeah. or whatever, you know, it impacts you a lot more than it would when you were really young. Yeah. 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 It, it definitely does. Definitely does. Um, but Elliot, let's, let's go into, let's talk about some of the boutique labels, you know, because that's a big part of physical media today. I mean, the studios are still doing good stuff, but I feel like primarily it's the boutique labels that's really driving the, the market at this point. Um, what, what are some of your favorite, um, uh, labels going right now? Your, your top three, your top five, if you have it, um, your list will probably be different than mine, but it'll also, it also might be the same. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. It's, it's good that you asked. Cause I, I picked out a load of, uh, a load of films to talk about. Um, I'll start off with what I mentioned before second sight films. Um, I just, I uh, recently watched High Tension. I don't know. Did did you get this recently and watch it? Yep. I just watched this one over the weekend, actually. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I had it right in my stack. <laughs> um, and I've, I've also got, obviously, Mean Streets there as well. Mean Streets. I, I, I love Second Sight and what they're doing because... You yeah, know, say, do you whole... want to talk about Second Sight for a second? Because you've been experiencing Second Sight for a while. They, you know, they're based in your country. But uh, I've only... I think I dove into them with the guest 4K because I mm. love that movie and I was excited to get it. So that was my first second site I ever purchased. Yeah. But well, uh, like I mentioned earlier, you know, they've been around for decades. Yeah. Um, I, used, I used to work in a shop that sold uh, physical media and films. And when I was working in that shop, I remember Second Sight having their first uh, discount promotion in, in the shop. And I'd never heard of them. And it was literally all just uh, standard editions of, of films. You know, this was way before 4K. Um, yeah. They were they weren't doing anything limited edition at the time. And to be honest, it, just looking at the the discs, they didn't really uh, entice you that much. Even though they had good films in the catalog, they they weren't that attractive. Were they doing box um, sets from the beginning? Um, no, uh, there, there were occasional ones. They they. This was when they started doing limited editions. They would do um, some like television box sets, but they weren't doing like um, film box sets yet. Yeah. Yeah. What yeah. What was their first 4K? Was it uh, Was it Dawn of the Dead, or was there one before that? Oh, that's a good. I know question. that was that was 2020, I think, because that was the pandemic yeah. when they announced that. It It was. Yeah. It was when I first um, started this channel, pretty much. Hmm. I think you might be right. Dawn of the Dead might be, yeah, might be the first one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I lucked out getting a copy of that because it uh, it uh, was sold out, and I didn't get it on its initial run. But uh, I acquired it through other means later on down the line. Uh, but it's what, a fantastic did, did, set. Did you get the original? You know, the big box with the books yeah, and stuff. I think it's the original one. It's the big, uh, yeah, the big one with the books and everything. Yep, that's the, the one. Yeah, that was. Yeah, I think that was. Uh, I I got that after the guest, so it wasn't my first one. But yeah, mm. yeah, I missed out on um, the witch when they did the witch 4K. Mm. I, I got the standard. One. I got the standard Blu-ray, but I didn't get the the limited edition package. Yeah. The features yeah. on that were incredible. Like I was, I was blown mm. away. Like they had the entire cast come back and do interviews. Like that was amazing what they did with that. Yeah. Yeah, I love that release. But Second Sight to me is just like they're kind of positioned to, I feel like, take over 2024 at this point. <laughs> I feel like they're just just on a roll right now. They started yeah. it last year, but I, just, I feel like they're just ramping things up and really upping their 
quantity. They've always had the quality, but yeah, with the green room and possessor announcements, I was like, oh my God, second sight's just, uh, they're on another level right now. Mm. And if they keep it up, you know, they're going to be able to acquire bigger film licenses, if, you know, if they want yeah. to, because I'm sure, you know, executives at the bigger, the bigger companies will be looking at this going, wow, they, they really do make, they make a great product, but also they're selling these for, you know, higher prices than a usual, uh, you know, yeah. any old DVD. If they so, keep it up. We're going to be out of homes, man. We have to sell our house. <laughs> We'll have to make a home out of these <laughs> boxes. <laughs> yeah, crazy. But yeah, it's that second site is, um, I agree, they're, I'd say they, they've hit the ground running in 2024. They're definitely the top label so far, as far as announcements this year. Like, I don't think anybody else has been able to compete so far, but um, great label. I mean, they just, they clearly take pride in their work. I mean, the transfers are great. They always include a lot of great special features and packaging's fantastic. So yeah, I love second mm -hmm. sight. Love them. Yeah. Um, what, what's some other ones on the um, list? What, what, where should I go next? I'll mention, um, Radiance Films. I know you've, you've, Sorry, there's a there's a car a car <laughs> beeping outside. Um, it's on you to get yeah. out of their way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ra Ra Radiance Films. They they've been doing you know. <laughs> I'll, I'll wait. I'll wait. Come down. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Radiance Films. I just got one of their latest ones. Uh, I the Executioner. They are doing great stuff. You know, releasing yeah. films that I've never heard of before. Quite frankly. And these are films, many of them have never had a Blu-ray release anywhere in the world. And they're, they're doing great special features. Um, again, the packaging, e even on these standard uh, editions, not, not standard editions, but the non-box sets, you can reverse the artwork. Um, yeah. you, can you can take this strip out so you don't have to have any information on, etc. And there's booklets. They feel like um, the UK criterion, I mean. Yeah, well at this point. Kind of combined with Aero Video a little bit. Yeah. Well, I mean they they are filling in a a gap in the market, um, which I think has been missing for a while, you know. In in a time when you know, labels are just trying to keep afloat. So they they're yeah. trying not to to go under. So they they have to prioritize releases that make money. And sometimes in doing that, they, you know, a lot of these films that aren't that popular, that maybe people haven't heard about, they don't get releases. So when I see, yeah. when I see a label like, like Radiance releasing a film like this, that most people have probably never heard of, and it's actually a great film. Uh, I think that's just, just a, a really good thing. Yeah. And I mean, they just got started last year and their output's incredible. Like they're just they clearly had a plan like moving forward mm. they're just announcing well, stuff. It feels like all the time putting stuff out and yeah, I definitely want to dive more into their stuff uh, in 2024. I, I forget which one I watched recently. I, Do you I know which I, one I posted it. I, and you, you commented I, on it. I, was it like I murder, murder yeah, so by in, numbers or something? Hold on. No, the facts of murder. That's what it was. Yeah. So in the UK, we actually got this box set. Somebody was telling me about one. that box set. Yeah, but in in the US, you just got the the facts of murder because I think gotcha. the other two licenses weren't available. Were those um, all directed by the same guy? Same no, so the, no, the, these are three three different noir films from around the world. Okay, so facts of murder was Italian, uh, witness in the city is French, and then I am waiting is Japanese. So it's, oh, wow. it's kind of showing, it's showing film noir from three different perspectives from around the world. But yeah. the facts of murder, the, the one that you watched was from a 4k restoration. And I thought it looked amazing. Yeah, that, even that was Blu -ray. insane. Yeah. Like, um, yeah. when they do those 4k scans like that, I'm like, you know what? I, if they do a 4k of this, I'm not going to need it. Cause like, this is mm -hmm. the best, uh, presentation. I feel like this movie's going to get yeah yeah hdr can do some good with the black and white and contrast show a little bit more depth but that picture yeah. quality was outstanding for sure yeah 
on that on that subject you know when people say such and such a film needs a 4k but if it already it has an amiibo, i'm guilty <laughs> well no i i do as well to be honest but when the film already has a great blu-ray presentation yeah. i always think there are some other films that really do need the 4k i do try to do it for movies that um i don't feel like have the best blu-rays as it mm. is right now um yeah like i know you as much as me want to see austin powers the first two at least on 4k come on now we need yeah. that or l let's just think here a trilogy 4k box set from second sight all three films we need 4K. it let's let's do it, <laughs> it. are you a big fan of the third austin powers you know i've only seen that one one time and it was in the so I, not as much as the first two the first two are like I don't yeah. even know which one's my favorite. It goes it goes between the first the first two. The third one is more kind of I guess nostalgia at this point. I remember yeah. seeing it when it first came out. I had the soundtrack on CD. Um I remember just quoting it nonstop, you know. Yeah. Obviously gold, all three of those gold movies that all three of those movies have great soundtracks. Like they could include the soundtrack and yeah. and for everyone in that box set as well. Mm. That's that's they're sitting on a gold mine, right there. Yeah, but yeah, I'd, I'd love to see the, the those <laughs> films on 4K. Uh, do you feel like we don't get enough? Uh, I don't know how into like comedies you are, but do you feel like we don't get enough comedies upgraded to 4K or or big lavish like box set presentations of comedy movies? Do you feel like there's a bias against comedies of, in physical media? Yeah, not just in physical media. I, I think in films in general comedies have a much harder time because as well as trying to make a good film comedy in itself is subjective you know yeah a comedian a comedian that you might like i might not like might not find funny you know jokes are so subjective like something that really makes me laugh you know my wife probably hates so yeah when you make a comedy film you know, you've really got to connect with the the comedy or you're going to not like it. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think about Adam Sandler, you know, I, I love Adam Sandler. I'll watch, yeah. I'll watch almost any of his films. My wife and Even, I saw him live last year and it was one oh, of the best wow. experiences I've ever had. <laughs> I loved it. We just watched, um, I've got it here one second. Cause I picked this up the other day cause I didn't have it. Uh, the film Bulletproof, you know, the Damon Wayne. I do. Have, I found that at a thrifting market, or uh, I think like a year and a half ago for like four bucks yeah. or something. So I picked up the old Blu-ray, uh, which which still looks fine, by the way. And yeah. I know a lot of people don't like that film. They think it's kind of a bit. I haven't seen it in forever. Rough. Yeah. It's one of those films where you could tell the studio just got two of the biggest comedians and they just wanted to make like a buddy but yeah, Damon Wayans Wayans was so funny too. Mm, yeah. Like, man, I love major pain. It's like <laughs> one of my yeah. favorite movies from my childhood. Yeah. Um, blank man. Yeah, but... Blank man is a movie that needs blank the 4k man. treatment. 100%. <laughs> I'll die on that hill. Yeah. Or even like, um, I know it's not Damon Wayans, but it's the, the Wayne brothers, you know, like the scary movie and scary mm. movie too. I, I like, love the first movie. <laughs> I have a soft spot for that, like especially yeah. the second one when they're, they're spoofing The Exorcist at the start. Yeah, <laughs> it's just it's just so funny, so funny. And people, a lot, a lot of people don't find that stuff funny, especially over here in the UK. Yeah, so it just shows how that, that first scary generally. movie, like it, it ruined Scream for me. Like I, I'll watch Scream now, and all I can think about the whole time is just all the jokes from Scary Movie, and <laughs> I, I can't take the movie seriously at all anymore. But. Well, what, what's interesting, uh, when Scary Movie came out, I, I was still quite young, and we got it on DVD. And I, I was probably a bit too young to actually watch it. Yeah. And I hadn't seen Scream. So I was watching Scary Movie before having seen Scream, not really getting yeah. the references. And then it was only when I watched Scream much, much later. I was like, oh, that's the bit from, that's obviously yeah. the bit from Scary Movie. So yeah, a weird way to watch it. Yeah. Um, I I feel like, you know, horror definitely gets a lot of love in physical media and uh, 
you know, crime as well. And, um, but, uh, action's another one that I don't feel like gets enough love, mm. um, or enough, you know, lavish box set treatments. And so yeah, action and comedies, I would love to see get better, mm. better treatment in the world of physical media. I mean, I want second sight to give me a big 4k box set of con air or something like that would be. Oh yeah. Fantastic. I, but that's owned by Disney. So we'll, we'll never see that. It's a whole nother topic. It's funny you mentioned Con Air because uh, just today off my shelf, I got, uh, I've got this, um, it's a Blu-ray box set of a uh, Jerry Bruckheimer produced movies. So it's got Con Air, it's got Crimson Tide, um, Armageddon, you know, The Rock, yeah. um, Deja Vu. Oh, the films Rock like so that. great. I don't love The Rock. Yeah. And like all of those films, I would love to get 4K releases. But like you say, Touchstone, Disney, who knows? Disney like owns all of it. They like own every great movie from my childhood. I get upset sometimes when I think about it because it's like, um, you know, the movies, I feel like everybody's getting their movies of a certain age, like from the 70s and the 80s. But it's like my sweet spot for movies growing up as a kid. The ones that I have the most nostalgia for personally are all in the 90s, early 2000s, and it's like Disney owns like every single one of them. <laughs> um, yeah, but I, th- I think our time will come, though. I think all of those 90s movies, they'll I get that 4K. So, I hope so. I yeah. still want my 4K box set of Blank Check, uh, Disney's Blank Check. You ever seen that movie? No, no, i never seen that. Great film. Great 90s film. Um, do you have any other picks for your top, what, top uh, labels? Top labels. Um, let's have a look. I'll mention um, Eureka because obviously the big news that Eureka are going to be be releasing yep. in the in the US. Yeah, saw you so, did a video about that the other day. Um, great. Video. Yeah, so that they, they do some really good stuff. You know, lately they've been doing a lot of martial arts stuff. So if you, I don't know how much you're into martial arts films it's a huge blind spot for me I, I tried to get into them last year and i just um i fell off it's not that i didn't like it i watched like the lady whirlwind uh mm. little two-pack that arrow put out and i was like i'm gonna get into martial arts movies and i didn't yeah it's funny yeah lady whirlwind this this is angela mao who was lady whirlwind so yeah, yeah. I, i'm the same you know, a, few, a few years ago um all of this martial arts stuff i mean i knew jackie chan you know, and, and Bruce Lee and, and, you know, the big films. But a lot of this stuff was completely new to me. And to be honest, I didn't think I would be interested. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I kind of turned my nose up a bit at those films. Yeah. Um, but actually, they're a lot of fun. They're a lot of fun. Um, it's It's been hard for me to get into Asian cinema. I need to find that um, that entry points. Fun mm-hmm. now find a way to vibe with it. I don't know. I love Italian cinema. Like I've, I'm completely like all in on anything Italian. Like I love spaghetti Westerns, mm-hmm. um, Giallo films. You know, I like that crime. Th- I need to get into more Italian crime films, but it's uh, Asian cinema has been a little hard, harder for me to get into. Mm. Well, yeah, there's, there's going to be a lot of good stuff from Eureka. I'm sure coming soon. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if you're, much into silent films or if you've ever gone that that far back in in history but you really do a lot of good they do a lot of good silent releases um and i think you know some of their releases are the best way to kind of first engage with uh silent films so yeah i thought about getting that one when it came out yeah it's a great one pandora's box um so yeah eureka I, i mean i've i said before on my channel that they are the reason why, you know, I'm collecting and why I got all this stuff. Um, they are the first boutique label that I ever came across before, before boutique Blu-rays was even a term. Um, yeah. You know, I saw them on the shelf in the shop. They were in a clear case, so not the normal blue for Blu-ray. And it just, I was like, what's, what's this? Why is it in a clear case? It doesn't make sense. And uh, just pulled me in. Um, yeah. and one of, I think I probably said this last time to you. One of the first ones was the film Repo Man. Um, oh, yeah. It, yeah. It's a great, great film. Yeah. Yeah. Criterion put out a really great edition of that. I love that mm-hmm. little. That's one of the best like digipacks they've done, in my opinion. Best artwork. 
anyway. Mm. Um, do you have anything else, or is uh, oh, I, I can keep your top. I can keep going if you want. Keep going, man. Well, let me bring <laughs> one up um, yeah. that you haven't brought up yet. Arrow video is definitely killing it oh. for me right now. I, I love Arrow video. They can almost do no wrong. I'm even defending them now when they release stuff like Basket Case on 4K. I'm like, look, Basket Case, fun horror movie. Um, you know, let's wait and see what happens the rest of the year. I feel like everybody was piling on Arrow the other day when they announced their April stuff, and it's like Arrow video's dead. I like saw that in the comments section. I'm like, really? Because oh. they had <laughs> they've had what? a couple of you know slower months after like eight months of greatness. Like you're gonna say Arrow video's dead. Like they're just they're recalibrating. They're you know figuring out their course yeah. for the rest of the year. I, I feel like Arrow for years has been getting that now. Like people yeah. in the comments are always saying, oh, "Why why are you releasing this? Why aren't you releasing this film that just I love?" You know, <laughs> it's, it's like they yeah. can't release everything. If if they could, they. Yeah, would. I guarantee you, they would be doing a lot of those films that you love if mm. they they were able to get them. So yeah, I think that's a big part of it as well. Yeah, yeah. Which we can people, we can talk. I got that as a topic somewhere later on. Yeah. Like people will just say something totally out of the blue, like, why can't Arrow do a big uh, you know, Halloween box set or something? And it's just not how <laughs> this work, you know. But first of all, Halloween is being released by other labels and you know, yeah, licenses. So yeah. People yeah. will always Nightmare on Elm Street. Where's my vinegar syndrome? Nightmare on Elm Street 4K box set. Well, yeah. It's probably going to be Warner Brothers that puts it out, and it's going to be a little thin package with seven 4K discs in it of all the movies, and that's all we're going yeah. to get for Nine Round. No, and no slip cover, no special features. No slip cover, no features. That's that's how they roll over there at Warner Brothers. Yep. Maybe in the UK though, you all get special features. I feel like Warner Brothers treats you all a little bit better in the UK. Well, it's it's not that they they don't actually do much work. All they do is they put the old Blu-ray. Yeah. In the package. <laughs> With the old special features, yeah. Um, although we did get slip covers for Rio Bravo, which I know you guys didn't get did. in the US. Yeah, did. That was yeah. that was exciting. <laughs> yeah, Rio Bravo was a fantastic um, 4K um, mm. that looked great. But yeah, Warner Brothers does good work. They do good work with oh, their yeah. transfers overall. I would say. I don't know mm. if you saw the color purple, but that was probably the best. Uh, that was one of the best no. 4Ks I saw last year. No, great. that's that. That's on my list to get soon. Yeah, I I did yeah. manage to get a, a lot of their releases last year. Um, you know, I thought Training Day was very good. Mm -hmm. um, what else? Jaws two get... at them? No, that's that's Universal. Universal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jaws two was great though. I want Jaws three yeah. and the Revenge. I want them all. Uh, I've <laughs> only ever I've only ever seen Jaws and Jaws two. I haven't gone any further. So. <laughs> Those will oh, be I'd, I'd watches. Dip your toes in those waters. You'll, you'll, <laughs> you'll, you'll have a good time. I feel like you'll have an open mind when you watch those. And yeah, maybe not the fourth one. Fourth one's just dull. Like it's that's its biggest crime, and the plot's just ridiculous. But the third one's like set at Sea World, and it's it's fun. I don't know. I like the third <laughs> so, one a lot. So is it like Jurassic Park then? <laughs> See, I grew up with all four of them. Like I used to watch all four of them together and i did i didn't know which one was better i didn't care about that stuff i was like i'm just watching all the jaws films it wasn't until i got a little bit older i'm like oh the first one's oh. just the first one and it's that much better than the rest of them but um yeah it's, it's kind of like jurassic park a little bit there's you know big underwater like tunnels and stuff where people go under and jaws of course attacks the window and stuff like that mm -hmm. but <laughs> um but yeah aero video love aero video uh, yep. The Psycho box set last year was incredible. Hellraiser. I even got the Chucky box set, even though I had all the 4Ks anyway from Screen Factory. <laughs> but I, I had to get it. Um, and they've yeah. just been doing stuff that you wouldn't think they would do. Like, that's why I like Arrow. They just kind of, they go outside the box sometimes. Like uh, Witness on 4K was oh. was an amazing release from them. Yeah, um, I, wish, I wish I got Witness because I've... I, I I really want to get that 4K, and obviously it was a US only witness, which was a yeah. shame. Yeah. How do you feel about? Do you feel like you all get shorted a little bit in the UK from Arrow Video? Um, I don't know because it it, it goes back and forth. 
because yeah. I know with their, their announcements last week, what did they announce? Well, it's just okay. what we were just talking about. It's like, if they could do it in the UK and the US, mm. they would, you know? Yeah. Like, uh, oh. you know, basket case, they're doing in both UK and US. Mm. <laughs> but yeah, I don't think a lot of people are as interested in that. No. Um, but yeah, sometimes we get really good stuff. Sometimes you get really good stuff. Sometimes yeah. we both get it. I imported time. more stuff from Arrow last year than I ever have, like Blood and Black Lace and the Lighthouse release. Mm. Like those were amazing releases too. Oh yeah, Bl- Blood and Black Lace was just amazing. Yeah, I was so glad we got that. Yeah, um, that was great. That I was didn't great. get the um, I didn't get the Bruce Lee box set. I, I wish I could have got that the the big four K Bruce Lee set, but no, sadly yeah. not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Arrow Video is definitely um. A top label for me for sure. But what what else you got, Elliot? Um I've got let's go with I'm gonna go with sorry, I'm being indecisive here. You're fine. Uh, I'm gonna go with Studio Canal. I mentioned Studio Canal earlier. Okay. So I guess they weren't on my radar as much last year. So I'm hoping that you can enlighten me on some great studio canal releases yeah i mean because d- does studio canal release in the u.s i don't think they do directly i think they like no, but i found a lot of stuff will c- end up coming here that studio canal puts out that's why i don't jump on their stuff right away because mm. i feel like lionsgate puts out a lot of their stuff at yeah some and, point. and criterion as well have been um yeah. like uh they did the others with the nicole kidman movie over here that was okay really good. Yeah. that was but studio canal it- yeah, and I think the Criterion disc was basically the same. Um, I think I think they were the same, yeah. But they've they've released stuff like I don't think this has a US release yet. Do you know the film The Pianist with Adrian Brody? The Yeah, that's Roman the Polanski. Holocaust movie. Yeah, Roman Polanski. The one that it won I think the, we got a Blu-ray. I think Shout put out a Blu-ray here or something, maybe. If I'm thinking of well, that right. This is a this is really fascinating, and I, I want to get your opinion on this. So it's a 4K disc, and it went through quite an interesting um, restoration process because when the film came out in 2002, it was only finished at 2K. So it was they had an HD finished file, and they upscaled it a bit. And then there, there's some uh, CGI in this film, like some explosions and stuff. And for the 4K restoration, they went back to the original 35mm film, rescanned it in 6K to make this. But the film actually looks much better than it did when it came out on the yeah. original release. So people are actually saying that even though the film looks amazing on the 4K disc, it doesn't actually look like how it was in cinemas when it when it came out. Because the thing that was shown it. in because what was shown in cinemas back then was this you know 2k finished version um so th- th- there's a whole feature on this 4k disc talking about the process and wh- what they went through um, yeah, so yeah f- very interesting did they get um Plancy's still alive isn't he he or is and obviously, okay. oh, i mean obviously. did they get his approval or does that matter anymore because i, you know, I, I don't know I mean, obviously, <laughs> obviously it's a very kind of <laughs> controversial kind it's of a very subject. sticky situation to get it, it is because i mean look you know can can you separate the artist from the art i don't know yeah. but personally he definitely, I can. he definitely made a lot of great films like yeah you know Rose rosemary's baby is one of my favorite horror movies of all time yeah and uh chinatown is a, is a classic and the pianist is, is great um but no i don't he wasn't involved in any way in this i know the restoration was done by yeah. the the cinematographer i think he he oversaw the whole thing yeah i guess um, if it was any other filmmaker maybe i'd have issue with it but uh you know it's polanski so who cares yeah. if it made it better it made it better you know but yeah, that was, this is a great release that they did. Um, they also do, not 4K, but they, they tend to do a lot of, um, they release a lot of British films from the 1940s and 50s, which would other, otherwise they, they would get lost. 
Um, so yeah. I've just picked a, a totally random example. I don't imagine anyone's ever heard of this film. Uh, it's called Women of Twilight. It's a film from the 40s, no, early 50s. And it's just a, a British movie that recently got a 4K restoration. And they, they put it out on this disc. Um, it's not, you know, it's not a masterpiece or anything, but just to have it and be able to watch it in great quality. As you know, just it's just a great thing to have that option. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're doing great stuff in terms of going back to what we said about keeping films alive and, you know, preservation. You know, they're doing some, some great stuff in, in that regard. Yeah, of course. Of course. I did, I did want to get, uh, they put out Peeping Tom, right? On 4K? Yeah, literally this week. It's just come out. I don't have it yet. I think it's on the way. I was going to order that from Diabolic, but um, I didn't. But, um, because I feel like maybe they'll release it here. But, yeah, I, uh, I mean, I, I, I would all, I'd almost guarantee that Criterion will release that. Yeah, you think so? Yeah, I think so because it's. it's In your professional my... opinion, should I wait? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, I mean, in my professional, it wasn't too opinion. expensive though. I think it was like twenty five or something. Yeah, yeah, it's know. not. It's not an expensive. Um, it's not like limited edition or anything. But so will the Criterion if I pick it up during a sale. Yeah. But I'd almost guarantee because, like I said, Studio Canal have been licensing to Criterion, yeah. um, and Peeping Tom is directed by Michael Powell, who is, a, you know, a famous director that Criterion love. Okay. Know, he directed uh, he directed The Red Shoes, which is probably the most famous. famous I need to watch that. I've had that 4K for way too long. Oh, One I of my see. goals this I... year is becoming seventy five percent watched on my Kinos and my Criterions. And my vinegar mm. syndromes. That's like a big goal of mine. Uh, you you uh, can do it. Do, do you have? Do you I'm have? A, I'm at ten percent on each right now. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask. Do you do you have it all in a spreadsheet or logs? No, I'm I'm not that organized. I wish I was. I if I had to guess, I'd say on each one of those labels, I'm twenty five to thirty percent watched. Yeah, maybe a little bit more than that. Maybe a little bit more on vinegar syndrome than Criterion and. And Kino, but Kino gets me because every time they have a sale, I pick up like 15 titles, and um, I've got a lot of Kinos, a lot of unwatched yeah. Kinos. But. Yeah, I only just got into Kino Law by last year, um, with the 4Ks, but yeah, some of the 4Ks they've done have just been amazing. Yeah, I mean, uh, speaking of some of my top labels, um, Kino is definitely one of them for me over here. I've got a little bit of an issue with them right now because my kindergarten cop on 4k should have been here and it's not coming until tomorrow. And I pre-ordered yeah. that thing. Like as soon as they, not as soon as they announce it, but like at the beginning of the month, I think I pre-ordered it at the end of December from the Kino Lerber website. And uh, usually they have a problem like putting stuff out through Amazon, getting it out on time. But uh, usually if I pre-order through the website, I'll either get it before or after I'm still waiting on kindergarten cop and my copy of the, the, I don't know how to pronounce this. The Boogans. Oh, the Boogans. Is that? Yeah, I saw that. Well, I've not I, say, seen I say Boogans, but everybody's like, that's wrong. It's this way. Somebody told me it was Boogans. And then they were like, no, I was just messing with you. <laughs> and I think somebody said, say it like Booger. So it's like Boogans. Maybe that's it. Oh, okay. Maybe that's yeah. it. But yeah, I got that on 4K. And they're, they're supposed to come tomorrow, but uh, I love Kindergarten Cop, and I've been waiting for that tag on release for a while yeah um, i need that i need to get it yeah but kino is just um extremely consistent i don't even know how they put out all the stuff that they do it's like 30 releases every month i know um, and if i could i would get them all but you know 30 releases a month you just can't do they can't ship to the uk that. i don't know actually because the, the only time i've got them is through uh, one of the shops that imports that I was talking about before. Um, yeah. So I've never, I've never tried to buy directly from them. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great label. Um, I don't know. They, they're a label that doesn't lean on the packaging. You know, they don't need elaborate mm -hmm. packaging. It's just like put a slip cover on it and put it out and they get all kinds of stuff out. And, Usually the Blu-ray scans look great. The 4Ks are awesome. 
most of the time, 95 to 100 percent of the time. Um, so yeah, I, I love Kino Lorber, and they put yeah. out a, a wide variety of stuff. I feel like they're doing a lot of comedies. That's one label that's diving into comedies, um, horror films, action films. It is it feel like classics. It feels like they cover all the bases. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you have anything else? Um, before, we, before we move on to other areas, I'll do. Let me do one more. I'll do one more. Okay. I don't know if this is a label you're familiar with, but it's a US label. And I've only recently become acquainted with them. Do you know the label Deaf Crocodile? They're, they're a partner label. I don't think I have anything from them, but yeah, I know they're a vinegar syndrome partner. Yeah. Label. So I, I I only have one vinegar syndrome disc and then these two Deaf Crocodile ones. Um, but so far I'm very impressed. With the way they do a lot of animated stuff, right? Yeah. So the both, you have of these, animated? both of these are animated. They're both um eastern european animations uh, one of them so heroic times it's animation but it's all like uh, painted so you can see the brush strokes and yeah you know the the frames blend into one another so like a really unique way of uh, animating and it's like a medieval tale and stuff and then there's this other one that's stop motion called the pied piper um i have heard of that it's one a, it's a czechoslovakian one um but yeah, both of them just absolutely great. And, you know, no one else is really doing these kind of releases. Yeah. So they're, re- they're really, you know, filling a gap uh, inside the market. Tons of great special features as well. Um, they tend to do um, conversations with some of the filmmakers involved, you know, if they're still around. So, yeah, just been really impressed with these. And it kind of makes me want to go back and buy every single thing that they've done so far yeah i mean i think they've got uh, at least like 10 to 15 titles or something that they put out i'm still trying to learn all the partner labels and their their specific niches and and all that uh i know they're announcing 14 partner labels as we film this january the 31st they're announcing their 14 partner labels tomorrow right Um, so i'm excited to see what they come out with i tend to i haven't really dove into a lot of this stuff from the partner labels just because i'm so unsure about a lot of it um but i i i get a lot of their documentaries i feel like like the stephen king documentary i got which was really good and uh they released those etr media put out like the golden eye documentary and the tony hawk pro skater in 64 game documentaries and I, I got those um yeah i've i've, I've not seen those but that's the kind of stuff you know i love yeah yeah and the packaging on those you just i couldn't uh, couldn't pass them up but speaking of vinegar syndrome they're a label over here that's just you know taking physical media over i feel like if second sight's doing it in the uk their vinegar syndrome's doing it over here um they just they really seem like they're paving the way for what the market's going to look like completely in like the next five years going to be all collectors yeah. and they, they're, they're kind of just the the trendsetters at this point i feel like with their big uh elaborate box sets and packaging and their movie selection again it's always subjective but um it isn't the most mainstream or i feel like accessible for most people but they hooked me last year you know i, I just got bit by the vinegar syndrome bug and started buying a bunch of their stuff and i'm trying to slow down a bit this year but I just, uh, I can't help it when they keep releasing like stuff that looks really cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I said, I, I mean, I I'm, wish I'm I both could... excited and scared for tomorrow. What's going to happen. Hopefully they release <laughs> nothing that I think is interesting. Well, I'll be watching from the sidelines. You know, I'll just be a, an observer yeah. and I'll see, I'll see how things go for you tomorrow. Cause I, I would love to subscribe to them, but it's just, the cost is too much for me at the moment. I, I've almost, I, I almost did it last year. I didn't almost do it this year because they, they still did a lot of cool stuff last year, but they kind of disappointed me a little bit with some of their selection, but, um, but yeah, Southern comfort. They announced that I'm excited to get that. I haven't even got my January stuff in yet. That Walter Hill film. Yeah. I really want to get that. Cause it, that, that's one actually I'll, I'll, I mean, I don't have any inside information. That's one that could get a second sight 4K in the UK. 
because yeah. I know they, they released the Southern Comfort Blu-ray years ago. So it yeah. could be the kind of one that they do do one over here, but I don't know. Yeah, it, it feels like um, we're getting a lot of crossover recently. Are you? Do you feel like we're seeing that more than we ever have recently with multiple labels but not the same movie? I think so. I think it's, you know, it's everyone in the market, you know, wants to try and make more money to keep going and to keep afloat in these yeah. kind of uncertain economic times. I thought it was cool what Vinegar Syndrome did when they announced that, yeah, we're going to do those Cynthia Rothrock movies as well. Yeah. You know, it was kind of a little dirty because it's like, don't buy it from Eureka. Buy it from yeah. us. I mean, I, I thought it was good. It was good for the consumer. Because it's it good for the consumer to, to let people know it was coming. Yeah. They yeah, could have not I done think, that. And then people would have bought it anyway because yeah. it's vinegar syndrome. Yeah. But I think from Eureka's point, it probably did hurt. They they probably saw that. Yeah. Thought, when oh, I saw did I was, you have to did you have to do that? Uh, dirty sons of guns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it just just lastly on the vinegar syndrome stuff, I think the subscription model is something we probably will see more of from some other labels because yeah. it makes sense if you can kind of lock in you know your bottom line mm -hmm. and get get some money in the door at the start of the year it kind of takes off some of the pressure you know throughout the year you, you know what kind of releases you can afford to put out etc that's um, what people are used to now they're used to mm -hmm. the subscription model like in a world where everything has a subscription of some kind like yeah. that's uh you know. and the, the good thing is you know if you subscribe to vinegar syndrome it's it's not like subscribing to netflix because obviously it's much more expensive but at the end of the day you have something that is worth something you know you have yeah. a, a collection of films that you know worst comes to worst you could sell them on uh, and get yeah. most of your money back so you know it's, yeah. it's it's sort of an investment you could say yeah, I just I just love the way they do things, and they're just so um, you know their sites just so well structured and organized and easy to navigate. And that's not every single boutique site. Like I don't even know where the heck I'm going when I get on Screen Factory's website. It's like their new releases are halfway down, and you have to scroll <laughs> over like three places. Like vinegar vinegar syndrome, everything is like right there. All the new stuffs there. They have a way to navigate to all the partner labels and. Everything that they do is just, it's very well. They feel like they know what they're doing. And I, I appreciate yeah. that for sure. They they definitely have a brilliant uh, business model and it's created a rabid fan base. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That will buy anything vinegar syndrome. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anybody, I mean, speaking of screen factory, I think that they're, they've definitely been coasting for a while and just, re-releasing stuff in 4k but a lot of different labels have been um you know doing that i feel like criterion's kind of doing that a bit as well hmm. um but uh, they've been doing some interesting stuff you know i'm excited for the faculty on on 4k but they they've really upped their game with their their transfers like their some of their transfers last year were like mind-blowing and some of the best i saw last year so uh, like night of the comet was an extraordinary 4k so yeah um i i love i love that film I, ha I have the old arrow video blu-ray from years and years ago i got an arrow i didn't even know i had an arrow video blu-ray yeah it's got a an arrow video blu-ray that is obviously long out of print um, yeah. it just got released again on blu-ray from 88 films in the uk uh, no sign of a 4k here yet but uh hopefully it was gorgeous gorgeous Night of the Demons was as well. People under the stairs, the burning. You know, they got all the big horror titles. So it mm -hmm. makes sense that they're just like, all right, we're just going to re-release this stuff. It'll sell because it's it's the big titles. Whereas Vinegar Syndrome has all the more obscure stuff. But I do feel like if Screen Factory doesn't up their game in terms of packaging and just have a better business model overall, I feel like they're going to get left behind in the next yeah. four or five years for sure. Are they still doing the slip covers on a, on every release? They're still doing the slip covers. Um, Cause I know for years, randomly they'll do a slip case, but it's very few and far between like JFK got a really nice slip case edition. Yeah. Recently. Slip I, I know, I know that um, 
years and years ago, I'd, I'd go on eBay and I'd just kind of look at what sells for a lot of money. Some of those Screen Factory slip covers, just the slip covers on their own, were selling. The Sleepaway <laughs> Camp ones are the most expensive, I think. Yeah. So it's kind of crazy that we'd pay that much just for a piece of cardboard, but I, you know, <laughs> I, I, I've been I've been there, I've, I've been there before, so I, I I know what it's like. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I I try not to get too hung up on that kind of stuff. Um, I definitely feel the FOMO when all this stuff comes out now, because for a while I couldn't really collect like I do now. Um, so I, I'm missing a lot of slip covers. I'm not going to go back and try to collect slip covers for everything that I have now that I've bought way later on without them. Um, but some people will and more power to them. I just, uh, I would maybe pay $2 for a slip cover, but I wouldn't pay 50 or 60. I know that. Yeah. At what point do you just try and print your own copy of a slip cover? <laughs> There's a lot of people over here that do that. Uh, I know a couple people that when Screen Factory announces something and they decide randomly to not put a slip cover on it, they do slip covers and sell them off online. They've created an entire business about it <laughs> on it. So more power to them. Um, do you have any other labels you want to discuss before we move on? Um, no, I think I'm. I think I'm good. I mean, I could carry on, but in the interest of time, yeah. I'll, <laughs> I'll let us move on. Well, moving into, um, you know, I had the in-store shopping experience, which we kind of touched on a little bit earlier. But uh, do you find yourself? Are you able to shop in store anywhere? Is there anywhere over there that sells physical media in stores? And how much yeah, do so you we... value that? Is that a big part of how you collect and what drives you to continue to collect? Yeah, so we we've got HMV, which is like the big uh, store that I talked about before. That they they mainly do music and some other pop culture stuff, but they do have quite a lot of films on sale. You can go in there and you can still pick up like boutique Blu-rays. You know, they they stock Arrow Video Day One. They stock um, Indicator, Criterion, etc., as well as all the big uh, studio releases. Yeah, and they also have they have another it's part of the same company there's a shop called fop f o w p which is where i used to work and uh they're the same but they they kind of sometimes have a different catalog um and it's good because going into fop they don't have uh, an online web store so when you go in there they have promotions that you can't get online so i always love i love going in there and just you discover something that is on like a massive reduction that you can't get for that price online so it, it kind of taps into that um I, I know a lot of people do the blu-ray hunting videos you know going into the store hunting for stuff and i enjoy that it taps into that kind of looking for looking for something even if you're not looking for something specific just like yeah. browsing and hoping you'll find something exciting yeah yeah i i love the in-store shopping experience unfortunately it's kind of regulated to thrifting shops now i wish i had something like uh, i know we, we have a place over here called the archive which has a lot of the vinegar syndrome stuff but they also have a lot of the other boutique labels but there's other places too like bull moose and stuff but that feels like it's all up like in new england and up there in connecticut yeah. and rhode island I massachusetts I actually, I just, the other day I followed the archive because I, I yeah. saw they were sharing something and it, it popped up on my algorithm or whatever. Um, and I sent them a message because I thought that they might ship internationally and they, they literally, they said they only sell in store, which I, I think is, that's mm -hmm. cool. It's, it's a good way of getting people yeah. into the shop and, and browsing. Um, yeah. You know, I'd, I'd love to, you know, one day, in an ideal world, if money was no object, you know, set up my own, my own small store here, mm -hmm. and, you know, have, have a big selection, and yeah. But no, nothing like that exists. No, um, no, like what do they call them? Like mom and pop shops. Yeah, is that, is that what they call them in the U.S.? So yeah, yeah, no, yeah. nothing like that. Pretty much the same thing. I think yeah. there's some places around me, like within maybe like a two or three hour driving distance, but uh, I've got a lot of places to do thrifting and pawn shops and peddlers malls and flea markets and places like that. But 
yeah. I don't have um, anything that's like big and legitimate. That's like specializes in physical media and movies, records, books, all that kind of stuff. Um, so prices, we, we touched on prices a little bit. Do you, how much do you think the pricing on some of this stuff is going to affect, uh, uh, how people collect moving forward and just the state of physical media? Cause there's no denying that they are going up a bit mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. Across the board. Yeah. yeah. It's a tough one because yeah, they're definitely going up over time. I think prices are going to continue going up. Yeah, and I, I think I I know actually that some people who they are collectors, but they won't spend, uh, you know, forty pounds for one film. You know, they won't buy um, yeah. one of the, one of the second sight limited editions because for them, and I understand this, you know, spending that much money for one film is a bit too much. Um, yeah, and yeah, it. I the thing is, that I used to be that way. You know, I was on a yeah. very limited, you know, budgets like 10 years ago. My kids are first born. My wife was a stay at home mom. And like, I couldn't get anything that I wanted <laughs> at all. I think that's why I'm running wild now because I'm just more able to do it. <laughs> yeah. But I understand that's like having to wait for that right price and thrifting mm. a lot and everything. So, yeah, in that respect, the pricing is, it is a negative. If I was to look at the silver lining of it, and the way it has affected me is that I'm trying to be more selective with what I buy. So, you know, yeah. if something is twice as expensive as it would have been five years ago, well, to afford it, I just cut back on some of the other discs that I would buy. Um, and that has the added effect of not taking up as much space because these shelves are basically almost full. So I need to work out the, the storage solution. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's just like with anything else. I mean, I feel like the prices of physical media isn't going up near as much as my grocery bill is. Um, I'm paying almost, I feel like 50% more at the grocery store than I was like two or three years ago, mm. which is crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah, for us here, it's like, you know, energy bills and mortgage yeah. prices. And yeah, that's the big stuff that's going up in price a lot. I feel like relative to everything else, it's not as bad. And I feel like, you know, back in the eighties and nineties, like it was even more to go like a VHS mm -hmm. tape or I think somebody posted yeah. prices for like a VHS back in the eighties or early nineties. And it was like 50 or 60 bucks. Yeah. I remember uh, I was talking about how expensive. just a regular release. <laughs> yeah. But. I, I was talking about how expensive stuff was today. And someone pointed out that laser discs, when they came out, laser discs were about a hundred dollars per, yeah. per one. So it, yeah, it's it's not new, but it, yeah. it's definitely it's getting more expensive. I think it it really hits people that really want to you know collect those premium box sets and steel books and stuff like that because you can't wait for a sale on those. Sometimes if you don't jump on those immediately, you're, you're just not going to get them yeah. unless they reissue them somewhere down the line, which we're seeing a little bit with the steel books and stuff over here. Um, mm. But most of the time, the second side box sets and arrow box sets, they don't come back. Yeah. I think that's not talked about enough is the psychology of these limited edition, you know, FOMO boxes and the effect yeah. that has on people. Um, because it, you know, all of these labels will be aware of how it works. Mm -hmm. um, I know that many of these labels, they, they know they're do... catering to psychopaths at this point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> me, me and you are case in point. You know, we are psychopaths, yeah. but yeah. Uh, these labels know, I, I think a lot of them is, it's contractual that they have to do a limited run to generate more money and then they can have the standard edition. Um, so, but yeah, it, I think they don't always think about how it affects the consumer. You know, a, a lot of people, you know, they might have, you know, compulsive desires, maybe even actually yeah. having like legitimate OCD. And the, people do feel like they need to, to get everything. Um, yeah. When I, when I was working in 
the the uh, shop years ago there was one guy that would come in on release day or on a monday when films just came out and a film would come out and he would have to get 10 copies and you know to me or you that's like why why would you do that and he just said he had to do it he, he couldn't not get yeah. 10 copies of of every film and obviously that he you know he was broke you know you, you, after buying 10 copies of every film on release day you can't afford anything else but so i think it's it's something to be aware of you know and you know it's it's difficult because i i wish i could help people if they feel yeah. like they, they need to buy everything because really you don't need to collect everything you know um and and ultimately i've been in the position where i've i've been collecting every release from arrow video and eureka and other labels and it doesn't actually make you any happier once you have them all i, I can tell you that yeah. now you think that if you go back and get all the out of print box sets it's going to make you happy it's not trust me you'll find something else to yeah. desire and you'll want that new thing so it's difficult it's, 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 it, it's just not thing. sustainable either to think that you can continue to do that for mm. forever because eventually no matter how well maybe if you're just like the richest person in the world maybe mm. but it'll eventually catch up to you at at some point yeah. and you'll have to take a hard look at what you're doing yeah i mean people always say to me oh i must be the richest person in the world to have all these they don't realize i literally don't buy anything else you know this is literally <laughs> all i'm into that's what i try to tell people <laughs> um you know I, I feel like that's it's hard sometimes being in the position that we're in because we're in a unique position where we mm -hmm. have channels and you know you make a certain amount of money from like monetization or affiliate links so it's like you're putting that back into the channel sometimes by mm -hmm. buying stuff that maybe you wouldn't otherwise because you have a channel and you want to talk about it. Um, that definitely goes into it as well. So people see us buying what looks like everything mm. and they're like, Oh my goodness, how do you get all that money? But it's literally a part of, of what we're doing on here. Yeah. Um, so it's a, a little bit of a situation, a different situation. I feel like, uh, yeah, with it's, us it's on here. I always tell people to not use me as the model for what they should be doing. <laughs> no, yeah, me, me neither. Don't use me as the model for sure. Yeah, but uh, I, I definitely want to try to, you know, set a better example sometimes and hold back and show that I'm showing some restraint on a few titles here and there. <laughs> Maybe not everything, but uh, there's some stuff I just got to let go. And just yeah. uh, not think about it and i'll get it later it might not might, might not be the limited box set but it doesn't matter i got plenty of titles on the on the shelf with no slip covers it's fine <laughs> but do you stay awake at night thinking about those those missing slip covers <laughs> not not really not really um i'm fine with it i mean it is cool like when i see somebody's shelf and they're like i got the, every single slip cover i do have to fight the urge to there's certain lines that I'm like, I want to be a complete on this line, like the Vestron video line, or mm -hmm. I try to pick ones that aren't, that don't have as much. Uh, that's more realistic, but I hit a roadblock with that because there's one that's out of print and I can't find it anywhere with the slip cover. <laughs> so I'm like, well, now what do I do? I just collected all the other ones for nothing. <laughs> so, yeah. but I, I tried, it's a constant uh, battle to fight the urge. I feel like to, feel like you need to have everything mm. you know in a complete line or a complete collection or a specific label yeah especially when they put the spine number on it and you feel like you've got to get that's a dirty every... move right there it, it's a dirty it really is a dirty move they need to do it like arrow because arrow does it but it's very subtle it's like if you're not really thinking about it you don't mm. know that they do it but i look on the side and there it is av5 44 on Conan. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't feel like a big part of um, of the box set, I guess. It's not even on the box set. It's just on the case. Mm. Yeah. But Criterion sticks out, I feel like, the numbers. But um, were you ever at a point where you felt like, because I know you're a big Criterion guy. Did you feel like you needed to have every spine number in the Criterion collection? Um, at one point, yeah, I, I did. Um. Luckily for me, I 
I only collect Blu-ray and 4K, so I don't collect DVDs anymore, particularly. And a lot of Criterion's spy numbers are still DVD only. Still DVD. Because they they started their spy numbers when they started DVDs. So, but yeah, I, I did, you know, there's because there's other people on YouTube and on forums that have every single Criterion disc. Yeah. And I used to, I used to look at that and think, oh, I want that. But yeah. then the more I thought about it, it makes more sense for me to just pick the ones I'm interested in. Yeah. Because if, if I have every film in the Criterion collection, it doesn't really say anything about my tastes and what I'm yeah. into. That's um, true. So I like having, even though I have a lot, I have, God, I must have 500, 600 Criterion discs at this point. But that's still only about half the spine numbers. So while I do have a broad taste, it isn't literally everything. Yeah. And I definitely know people that uh, they have every single Vinegar Syndrome release as well. And those are numbered. But again, I feel like it's, uh, well, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty big on the side. VS, mm -hmm. this number. They've got so many different lines, though, at this point. They got like 10 different lines that they do. VSAs, VSUs, VSPs. BSL, they're going to have every <laughs> single letter of the alphabet before too long. It's impossible <laughs> to keep up with. But even, you know, going back to that, feeling like you need to collect them all, like they just started the cinematography line. Yeah. And they put out Little Darlings on 4K and Red Rock, Red Rock West. And I got Little Darlings on 4K. And then they announced Red Rock West and I got the Umbrella Edition. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't need this. And then I'm like, well, it's the second one in this line, and maybe I'll want to collect this whole line. And because I'm complete on my VSUs, so I'm already committed to collecting all of those. Mm -hmm. I'm like, all right, this would be another one I try to collect them all for. So I got it. Now I'm going to have two copies of that. But the only thing that made me feel a little bit better about it was that they do both have different special features. Yeah. Um, and I, same as Mean Streets. Yeah. I, I do want to get those, that new line, um, Little Darlings and. Red Rock West, um, yeah. but I, I I've got the umbrella one as well, and uh, I like the box set. I like the yellow color and how it looks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I got streaming versus uh, physical media. Do you do you think that streaming and is the enemy of physical media? Is that's what is, is that what's going to lead to its downfall, or do you think of it as more of a complement? and that they can both kind of coexist together in, in a future. Um, I think... Because I'm saying things like the Criterion <clears throat> channel, and it feels like mm. it goes with the physical versions of Criterion. Yeah. It feels like it complements it pretty well. People use it to pick out which ones they want and stuff like that. Um, yeah. So I, I have nothing wrong with um, the technology of streaming. You know, the, the idea of having a streaming platform with... Uh, all these films that you can watch um, alongside physical media, I think that's actually a great situation to have both. The issue is that the streaming industry is set up to try and, you know, get rid of physical media in a way, yeah. not, not, in a, not in an evil way, but, you know, streaming is seen as the evolution of home entertainment. So it's, it's, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Next, it's seen as the next step and, having a disc or a tape is like the old that that's the old stuff um and in some ways oh, it's you know it's the evolution yes but it's also the de-evolution mm, in other ways as yeah. well it feels like but people don't yeah. grasp onto that as much yeah and i also think there's a lot to be said about the values film i feel like a little bit more yeah oh definitely there's a lot to be said about the psychology of streaming platforms and how on netflix you might have access to hundreds or thousands of films at one go but because there's so much choice and because s films get lost amongst the noise you really don't have as much access as you think and sometimes having a limitation is actually a good thing you know having the choice of 10 films is actually better than having a choice of 10,000 because at least you're able to see everything and make a make a good solid yeah. choice the way that Netflix is, and I, I keep using Netflix as an example, but obviously I'm talking about all of them. I'd say um, it's yeah, they're pretty much the example of streaming at this point. I'd say yeah, the top if, you on, if you go on Netflix, you know they ha they have it set up so that obviously their 
they're scraping all the the data of how you use Netflix. They they know exactly how long you spend looking at a certain image. They will change the poster image depending on who you are. So I've noticed yeah. that if I go on my on my wife's profile, all of the films will have different actors in the image. Really? They they change it based on yeah, they change it based on who you are That's and crazy. What, what actors you like to watch and things like that. Um, so you know, and they just want to keep you on their platform. So they promote the things that will keep you on the platform, which makes it very hard to find new stuff and to find obscure yeah. stuff and to find the kind of stuff we would want to watch on physical media sometimes. So it's not that I have any problem with the idea, the technology. It's just how it's all set up, I think, is yeah. trying to just capture as much attention from you. And that is such a, a weapon against physical media. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it should be I, a I, part of the equation. It should be a way for people to enjoy films or TV. It shouldn't be the only way mm. to do it. And I, I feel like you're right. That is the way that uh, most of these studios and these companies that that's the way they want things to go. Yeah. But I will say I'm seeing more people and I use the term normal people, people that aren't collectors, um, you know, friends and family in my life that they, they watch Netflix and they're getting annoyed when their favorite films or TV are removed. Yeah. Um, so, and, and in those situations, I'm telling them, you know, come, come back to physical media, you know, <laughs> buy, buy, buy your favorite. You put, film. Your, you put your cloak on <laughs> dark <laughs> yeah. robe and walk in there. Yeah. yeah. I do my Jedi mind control thing. Come back it, to the dark you know, side. I, I tell them, you know, at least own, your top five favorite films, you know, you should always have them at least. Yeah. You know, you, th I don't think anyone should be in a situation where they don't own any films at all. If you're in any way interested in films. Yeah. I get it. If you're just a, uh, you know, a passive fan and you see maybe mm -hmm. two or three movies in the theaters that you're interested in a year, like, you know, and you primarily just watch like sports and stuff like that. I, I, I get mm -hmm. that. Um, you know, not wanting to own something, but if like, if you're into movies, I just, I don't understand somebody being able to rely solely on streaming. If you're actually like super into movies and TV, that just idea doesn't compute with me. I don't know. Yeah, but. I, I, I agree. And, you know, I think we might see a tiny bit of a swing back, you know, as people get a bit more frustrated at having to have all these different subscriptions. You know, my yeah. my parents, they have about 10 different streaming services and that's costing them, I don't know, however much a month. Are you are you starting to do you think we're close to seeing that bubble burst, you know, because we're seeing the, the prices raise and over here they did a thing with Amazon Prime to where I mean, most people are signed up for Amazon Prime to get the free shipping, but the streaming service was free with that. And now they're mm. going to charge you two ninety nine. If you don't want to watch it with ads, they're just going to add mm -hmm. the ads. And if you want to go ad free, it's going to be an extra two ninety nine. So it's all these little up charges here and there that I think are just going to discourage people away from the streaming services. Yeah. I, I think we are going to see some of that. The only thing is I've noticed now that these streaming services have been around for so long, you know, for the past decade that people are so accustomed to, to paying for them and seeing yeah. them on their bank account that they are almost like a utility bill, like paying for water or electricity. Like a cable bill. Yeah. Yeah. So people, people don't even think about canceling Netflix. Um, recently Netflix, they, they clamped down on uh, password sharing. So if you were in the, the yeah. same fam family or friends, you couldn't share passwords anymore. So you had to get your own subscription and their subscriptions went up massively after this. Um, because people still wanted it. So I, I don't know. Maybe people have just taken it on board that it's a given. Yeah. That, that you think they'll just, they'll, you know, understand that it's a part of inflation and just keep on with it any, anyway. And the raise in costs isn't really going to drive people back to the physical yeah. media in droves. Because I, I feel like some people, that's a part of the conversation for them. They're like, physical media or streaming is going to burst and everybody's going to run back to physical media which I don't really see that being the case at all. Like maybe people do wisen up and they do buy 
their 10 favorite movies or something like that. But mm. I don't see a mass move back to physical media from streaming. No, I mean, all we need to keep physical media is uh, to keep physical media alive is a certain level of people involved. You know, we don't need the whole world to buy yeah. DVDs and Blu-rays again. You know, we don't need that. We just need, you know, enough people. And I don't know what that number is. Um, well, getting into that a little bit, because I've talked about this before. Do you think, because you're talking about enough people, what happens when those enough people are either too old or they start, you know, leaving the, this earth and dying off? And mm -hmm. do you think that we've done a good enough job of properly raising the next generation into caring about physical media? In, in movies uh, because that's that's what I worry that's the thing that I feel like is going to kill physical media before a streaming service is just people's people not being as interested in movies and film as mm -hmm. they were in our era in the generations coming up because they have other things to preoccupy them like YouTube like what we're doing right now um, yeah. Twitch and other things you know kids will sit there and watch video games being played for 10 hours before they think about watching a movie mm. So, yeah, there's there's a lot that is vying for people's attention, especially uh, the younger people, you know, the teenagers nowadays. That makes me sound like such an old man saying teenagers <laughs> nowadays, but it's it's true. You know, people people that are just 10, 15 years younger than me, it's totally different now. Um, yeah. And I think the only thing is, you know, these things like TikTok and, you know, streamers and stuff if those people have um, an interest in physical media, they can help kind of spread the message in a way. Like I know on TikTok, I, I don't think um, our sort of physical media is, is popular, like film collecting, but I know books are very popular on TikTok. There's a lot of- Book like, is the one like form of physical media that I don't feel will ever go away mm, because it yeah. stood the test of time. Like it's been around for mm. forever like yeah but uh, yeah. the written word it, it, you know it's true thousands I think of years. All, honestly all we need is we need some very big advocates for physical media i'm talking much yeah. bigger than you you or i or or jeff at yeah. films at home i'm talking like really big i'm talking like um mr taylor swift showing off taylor, his, his yeah exactly Blu -ray collection. I, was, I was gonna say taylor swift because it's interesting yeah and I she's was, in the uh, position to do that right now because she has that concert film that well, she exactly. could be promoting to come out on 4K and Blu-ray. And my wife is actually interested in that. She's like, did well, that get announced for 4K? I'm well, like, it's, no, so funny. Yeah. it's so funny you say that because I was having this discussion with my wife. She's really interested in Taylor Swift. And yeah. there, there's no physical media release for the Eras tour that was recorded. And it's even at the point now where people are selling bootleg Blu-rays of yeah i've seen it the era's tour on on ebay um because you can get it i think it's in 4k quality on on itunes or, or wherever it is they sell it um so if you know if taylor swift came out and released her tours and her music videos on a collection of like 4k blu-rays or whatever even just a fraction of her audience bought that and then a fraction of that started buying some other uh, physical media yeah. That's it's a lot of planning that gateway, you know. Yeah, because you've got to think her audience is, you know, humongous, massive, and then just a, a 0 0.001 percent of that audience, if they started buying, you know, films on physical media, that would be huge. Yeah, that might lead them to buy Cats on Blu-ray because Taylor Swift is <laughs> yeah. in that as well. Um, and then before, and then, and then before, and then physical media will die again because nobody will want to buy anything else after that. They go from buying cats straight to vinegar syndrome. That's that's yeah, that's, that's the do. entry point. <laughs> How do you feel about um, you know we talk about influencers, you know, promoting physical media, but like the filmmakers themselves? Like I don't get why we're not getting more filmmakers come out in support of physical media. It's like we got Nolan, we got Del Toro. Um, I just saw Eli Roth promote the Blu-ray of Thanksgiving, but it's like, it's not something that I see widespread. No. Like it's just those three that I can think of at this point. Um, and I, I don't understand as a director, like how could you not be in support of having your, your film preserved on physical media? Like, especially seeing everything that's happened with movies and streaming and stuff that just can just get axed and there's no other way to watch it. 
Mm. So I don't get as a creator how you can be okay with that. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't and some people just that. they're just not in a position to speak up, I think. You know, a lot of the people that are making movies for streamers are just breaking into the industry. So it's like they're just happy to get a movie on a streaming service. I understand that, but like the bigger filmmakers, like yeah. a Scorsese or or, or somebody Fincher or somebody like that. Like they're making movies for Netflix and Apple TV. So, yeah, I, I, I mean, maybe it is that, that maybe they're contractually obliged not to, not to say anything bad about streaming. I, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Um, Could yeah, be. it's interesting though. If, if I was in their position, obviously I would certainly be, you know, sharing as much as I could about physical media. Um, but yeah, we we do need more people like them, like the filmmakers, talking about, you know, how good physical media is. Um, and I think you know, s selling the actual um, advantages of physical media to a big bigger audience. Um, so you know, like special features, for example, a lot of people don't really pay attention to how good special features can be. Um, if filmmakers were really like offering something amazing in a, in a package, then that could get more people involved. You know, if you're a huge, yeah. uh, say you're a huge Tarantino fan, but you don't collect physical media. If there was like some big documentary on Tarantino's films with all of the people involved and you could only get it on a disc, um, that's the kind of thing that can get people over. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know what the answer is. To be honest, I think I do wish more people were promoting it. Because that's that's what Eli Roth was doing, and I'm not really like the biggest Eli Roth fan, but I, I haven't even seen Thanksgiving yet. But he was on his Instagram. He was promoting the Blu-ray. He was telling people all about the special features, commentaries, everything that was involved in it. And mm -hmm. I just thought that that was really cool. Um, and I think that we need more of that kind of stuff out there to let people know about these. Uh, releases because there's a certain group of people that's just like they still make blu-rays dvds mm -hmm. that's still a thing they don't yeah. even realize that it's out there you know yeah because they're not in this world that we're all in i think there's a lot of big actors that collect blu-rays as well that we just don't know about yeah. i i have a very strong suspicion that ben affleck has a massive blu-ray collection because oh, i don't really? know if you i don't know if you remember during the pandemic when obviously everyone was living at home the paparazzi would take pictures of him coming outside his house picking up all these packages and they look like amazon packages that blu-rays would come in he'd have yeah. a big stack of them and then he'd go back in his house with them well that i mean that would make sense right he's he's a filmmaker he's a writer he's an actor like he's he's in this world. And I, I think that makes sense for like people that are into in that film industry to be, you know, uh, a proponent of physical media like mm -hmm. that and, and to collect it. Um, but if for some reason that doesn't translate to the heads of studios and stuff like that, because most of these heads of studios nowadays, they don't care about the movies themselves, much less, them getting physical releases they're all about the money um and i just think that we're getting to the point where they would rather just put it on a streaming service than give us the physical option because that would take away from any future sales or subscriptions to those those services i just don't feel like they want you to own their stuff anymore especially disney they're the biggest example of it yeah well i think their whole business model now is based on disney plus like everything yeah. funnels into Disney Plus, whether that's theatrical movies or, you know, past home video releases. It's all Disney Plus now, and they've gone, they've just gone all in on it. Um, and we'll see whether that pays off, you know, in ten years' time, whether it's yeah. the right choice. Obviously, for us, it feels like it's not because there's so many films that, you know, should come out on physical media, and. Um, even the the worst thing is just that when when Disney acquired Fox, all of the old Fox licenses for for Blu-rays, some of them that were licensed to boutique labels, they all expired, and all of those Blu-rays went out of print. Yeah. So it's yeah, it's two, just a two real big shame. One, two big horror movies I can think of that were licensed to Shout, The Fly, and The Omen. 
are at mm-hmm. risk of not getting 4Ks because they're Fox titles. But they were yeah. released in these, you know, big box sets with all the films in the franchise. Um, yeah. And the and the fly from David Cronenberg, that is one that needs some kind of 4K. Will look beautiful in 4K. Yeah. Because the blue the Blu-ray, from what I remember, doesn't look that good. I think there were some problems with it. So yeah. 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 Uh, well, I mean, speaking of studios, do you think that licensing in general of new titles will become an issue as we continue on, um, as studios continue to combine and dissolve? And eventually at some point, there's just going to be like one big studio, right? Who's going to own it? But it's just going to be one studio and then a bunch of independents like A24 and Neon. And um, But saying that, will the labels will they run out of stuff to put out because they can't license anything or at least big titles. They'll always have smaller titles, of course, that they can scrape up. But, um, vinegar syndrome finds all is, has an unlimited supply of films. They buy for 10 cents. Um, but the big ones, the ones that keep people engaged, like those mainstream titles, I feel like it's important to have a good amount of the mainstream releases to keep people engaged in the hobby um yeah or at least have that entry point to get in because if, if it's all obscure stuff then yeah we'll still collect it but how long will that last but yeah that's something I, I mean that's i really have been a problem yeah i mean i hope that doesn't happen i i think what what happens now is when when something like conan gets a uh, license to arrow for the studio that holds the rights to these kind of films, it's like free money for them because they're just licensing it out. Mm. Arrow makes the money. They generate the sales. The license holder gets a cut back on whatever, whatever it is. So for them, it's free money. And as long as that keeps happening, I don't see why they wouldn't keep doing it. Um, but like you say, if they, if they get really guarded with all their licenses, they might not want to do that at all. They might see that, the money that it's making actually isn't that much in terms of their whole company. Yeah. Uh, they might just, they might just think, Oh, I can't be bothered. Let's just focus on streaming. Um, yeah. And yeah, I mean, that, cause that would be a real, a real, a real bad thing. Cause that feels like the Disney philosophy. Like they don't want anybody to have any of them. They would rather their movies just die in a vault than <laughs> be put out for people to watch and enjoy. That's what it feels like. Maybe that's not, the reality of the situation, but that's what it feels like to me. So if other mm-hmm. studios start, you know, adopting that same philosophy or they all get together and they kind of agree on like one way to release their stuff from now on, I just, I don't know. Um, I mean, Universal is great about licensing stuff. Um, mm-hmm. Paramount is great. Warner Brothers does a fair amount as well, but like Disney, I just, they're not doing hardly anything at this point. It feels yeah. like, yeah. Wally, I think was like <laughs> maybe the last one they did. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a shame for sure. Yeah, I really hope things will change in that regard. But yeah, it, it must be that you know the people high up making these decisions in Disney, they just they either don't care or they literally can't make any changes. You know they. You know, maybe it comes from so high up that every decision has to make the most amount of profit. And something like releasing, you know, an older film on Blu-ray or licensing it out just doesn't make enough profit. I don't, I don't know. It just yeah. yeah, it's not it's not good for us. That's for sure. Yeah, um, I don't think so. I agree. But uh, yeah, I, I just worry about because um, people are already like they get frustrated when a month goes by and there's not something like huge. There's not a couple of big titles that were announced for from a specific label or something cool. And I feel like as we get deeper and deeper into it and they run out of stuff to put out, will that make collectors lose interest in the hobby? But mm. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's interesting. It'll, it'll be interesting to watch where things go. Yeah. Yep. Uh, well, I mean, that being said, as we close things out, because Elliot, I've had you for almost two hours. I appreciate your time, man. Um, what do you think realistically does the future hold for physical media? Uh, where, where do you see this going in the next five to 
to 10 years. Do you see a future without physical discs um, in your lifetime? I, I mean, the only situation where I can see that in the next five years is if something very bad happens in civilization. So, you know, the kind yeah. of stuff unrelated to physical media, but you'd need sort of complete, you know, economic upturn for physical media just to disappear. And then we've got bigger problems to worry about than, than Blu-rays. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, looking at it pragmatically, I think things are just going to continue as they are now. So we're going to have all the boutique labels. Things are going to get a bit more expensive as, as prices go up. Um, I think, yeah, I just think hopefully in five years time, things will be pretty much the same. I don't think, I mean, may, maybe some labels might be struggling financially and not showing it. And, you know, there's always the chance that some, What's label... do you see any labels dropping off? Um, big ones. No, I, I don't know what I can see is I can see some big labels getting acquired by other companies. Um, I honestly thought that around the time when we got the Wally Criterion 4K, and that was the time when Criterion, Criterion had 25% layoffs of the workforce, that's usually a major sign that they're about to be acquired by a bigger company when there's like restructuring. Yeah. Um, so I thought they were going to be acquired by Disney, and there was going to be some big announcement that Disney have bought Criterion, they're going to continue criterion and wow so i can see something like that happening you know definitely whether it would be disney and criterion i don't know but i can see you, you know recently there was that news about was it warner brothers and paramount potentially merging was it yes yeah yeah so like if something i've been really worried about that <laughs> yeah because yeah, i feel something. like it would it would be warner brothers that would take paramount under their wing and Paramount's yeah. so good about putting stuff out on physical media. And Warner yeah. Brothers is okay about it, but not as good. So, mm. I don't know. So, yeah, if, if crazy stuff like that happens, I can definitely see some of these boutique labels getting swallowed up. Because Do you ever do you see a streaming service uh, buying a label? I could see that. I could definitely see that. You know, it wouldn't be out of the ordinary to think Netflix might purchase Criterion. You know, because yeah. they have that relationship. Um, I've talked about so, this before, but like Netflix has so much like original TV and movies, like they could start um, their own label and go back yeah. to like physical distribution. Mm -hmm. Like think of a really nice like box set of Midnight Mass or something. Yeah. From Mike Flanagan. Oh, and maybe that's how they're getting all these big filmmakers. Maybe that's the promise that we're heading back into physical territory at some point. Maybe not do everything. You know, we don't need a Blu-ray or 4K release of every movie that Netflix has done. They've done some pretty, you know, trash movies. But we get a lot of <laughs> trash movies on physical media. And like you said, it's subjective anyway. So maybe we do want all those movies on Blu-ray. Yeah. And I guess Netflix has a history of physical media, you know, because they started out uh, as a disc rental service. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I read somewhere like that they were going to start kicking up like brick and mortar stores and i was like what exactly for would it be for like you know <laughs> for subscription uh, for swag Go. or something like netflix t-shirts i'm like what what would that be for and I, they got me thinking about physical media what if they did like a physical media store or something i don't know mm. yeah It'd be, it could be cool if they try to play both sides of it yeah i yeah it's interesting because i think over the last few years, a lot of companies have seen that they need to do their own streaming service. So like I've even yeah. seen like Lionsgate have launched their own streaming service and Oh have they? I didn't even know about that. I'm sure I'm sure they've launched like Lionsgate Plus. Maybe it's just in the UK. But lots of companies now, even smaller ones, have, have done their own streaming services. And I just don't think it's gonna work for everyone. I think mm -hmm. if you're a smaller company. Um, it's just not going to be, you know, financially viable. Yeah, you have um, to merge with somebody bigger. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's there's interesting stuff that could happen, 
but I think for the most part, things are going to stay roughly the same. We'll lose some labels, you know, but yeah, that's just, that's just the economy at the moment. Um, so yeah, what, what do you think though? What do you think any like big changes are coming in the next five, 10 years? Um, I'm like you. I mean, I think that it'll mostly stay the same for the next five years, 10 years. I can see there being some shakeups. Um, I feel like for the next like five years, we're going to be seeing like some of the best stuff we've ever seen as all mm-hmm. these companies are like fighting to stay relevant. Like we're going to see some like incredible packages and box sets and releases after that, when that run is over, I can see things mm-hmm. dying down a little bit. Yeah. As some companies start to show that they've been struggling a little bit, maybe haven't been letting it on. Um, I think there's a couple big labels that could potentially go away or fold in with another label, possibly. I could see Shout Factory maybe being a partner label of <laughs> Vinegar Syndrome <laughs> or something yeah. like that. Um, but I don't know. It, it'll be interesting for sure. I'm here for the ride for as long as it, uh, long as it keeps going yeah me too yeah i'm I'm here to the end i tell people i'm like you know don't don't be crazy about it but start uh these movies that you love and you've you've loved your whole life and you can't live without start um start scooping those up you know and especially if it's a disney title (laughs) oh yeah definitely Add, add add it to the collection yeah um but uh, one more thing I was going to ask you, and this is more like a, a personal thing. That's just uh, me and you kind of issue. But we have obviously built up, uh, you know, big physical media channels uh, that are reliant a lot on all this stuff to, to stay relevant. Do you, as we kind of move into the more like slow decline of physical media, if that even happens, but do you have any plans to like restructure the type of content you put out? Are you looking to move into um, any kind of like streaming content reviews or anything like that. Uh, have you thought about that at all? I guess is what I'm asking. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, I think about this stuff all the time. Yeah. Um, That's why I, I feel like it's what, something that nobody talks about, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, what, I mean, to be honest with you, the, my channel and everything, it all kind of happened by accident. You know, I, yeah. I'm sure I mentioned this last time, but I, I started off uh, seven years ago and I was just reviewing um, new releases, films that I saw at the cinema. Nothing same, to do with Same Blu-rays. here. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Well, I combined it in with Blu ray hunts. I'd be out hunting for Blu rays and I would go to the theaters and I would come out and give my All reaction right. to the movie in my car. I would do stuff like that. Yeah. Well, at the time, I was just reviewing films and then I did a video on Criterion. Um, and that video took off. It had so many yeah. more views. At the time, my videos were getting about 10 views each, like absolutely very little. And I think the Criterion one got 100 views in the first day. And I was like, oh, my gosh. And then because I enjoyed you know, physical media and I was buying a lot of it, I thought, well, I'm going to do more of this. And then it's just snowballed to the point where I'm, you know, I'm, yeah. that's all I talk about. But really, you know, I'm I'm into physical media because I love movies. You know, first and foremost, yeah. it's it's the movies. Um, because I, you know, I wouldn't be buying all this if if I didn't love movies first and foremost. And it's something that I want to I want to be involved with movies for my whole life. You know, I'd love to work in the industry in some capacity. You know, spending my day thinking about films is what I want to do. So. Uh, yeah, I'm thinking all the time about, you know, maybe branching out. Um, I tend to write a lot. So I, I write like little essays, you know, like little reviews of films and stuff that I don't publish. Yeah. I just keep them for myself. But I'm starting to think about doing, you know, video essays, which are very popular on, on YouTube yeah, where, for sure. you know, I write I write the essay and then I just edit clips together and stuff. That kind I, mean, of thing. I think we've talked about this before, but I I think you would be great at that. For sure. Oh, thank you. You have such a soft, like soothing voice. I could just visualize that over like some (laughs) clips and images. It would it would be great. Some people people I always get comments saying that I should do ASMR, you know, where where Ah, I 
I, I whisper into the microphone. <laughs> you know, some people probably already use your channel for that. At <laughs> yeah. This point. You don't even have to try. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just like thinking of, you know, just different, different stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just want, I want to be involved with movies. Um, and I do look at other, you know, creators on YouTube who talk about films and not physical media and they have massive followings and, you know, they've got, they've got the a good set. Of, you know, yeah. And like, they've got, you know, they're doing it full time, you know, they're making a lot of money let's be honest doing it because they've got absolutely massive audiences um i'm not gonna lie i'd, I'd love to be in that kind of position where i wouldn't yeah. have to worry about money and i could just talk about films all day um that's the dream isn't it yeah maybe, maybe that's why i need to get on tiktok me and you tiktok in on <laughs> i'd try man I, I can't keep up with it i really can't i put something out <laughs> yesterday and it was like i'm done for a couple of weeks um yeah I try to keep up. I, I'm just, I'm, I want that to go away. I'll be honest. I just want the short form stuff to go away. I've just been kind of waiting it out. They'll come yeah. back to the long form eventually, but it yeah. seems to be ramping up. So I don't know. I don't know what to do. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I think about that often as well. Just uh, maybe not stop talking about physical. I love physical media. I love talking mm. about it, but I also want to do videos that are more focused on just the movies themselves, I guess. Oh yeah. Yeah. When, when I say all that, I'm not going to stop physical media. I'm yeah. just going to try and do both, at, at, you know, at the same time. I, I don't think I could do it if I tried because it's like, it's almost impossible for me to even talk about a movie unless I got the physical copy in my hand. Yeah. I just feel comfortable doing it that way. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, <laughs> yeah. Um, but I always say that my channel is more about discovery of movies through the lens of physical media, because I'm somebody that I grew up loving movies. I watched a lot of movies, but also watched a lot of the same movies over and over again. So I feel like I missed a lot of stuff. I have a lot of gaps. I'm working on them, but getting into this channel, I'm like, Oh, I love movies. I know a lot about movies. I'll be fine. And then discovering that, you know, there's this whole world of cinephiles and film fans that have literally seen probably a hundred times more than I have. <laughs> And they're teaching yeah. me about stuff every day, and I love it. Um, mm. There's a lot that's of that I still got to fill in, and I'm, I'm discovering and learning along the way. That's an interesting point, though, because and, and this applies to everything in life. People are always at different points along the journey. So, yeah, you know, you could look at someone else and think they know so much about films that you don't know. But also, there are people who are just today or yesterday getting into films. And they would look at you or me and think they know so much that I don't know. Yeah. So you'll exactly. always have, you'll always have things to offer to someone. And that goes for anyone listening to this or, or watching this, you know, you probably know a lot about films that, you know, a lot of people don't know. And it's not that they don't want to know about it. They might really want to. So, yeah. Yeah. Only so much time in the day. Um, Mm. I tried to watch 40 films this month and I'm going to get sh just shy of I think 37 or 38 or something. So I'm trying to watch as much as I can <laughs> trying to catch up <laughs> where I can. Uh, Those are rocky numbers. You need, you need to watch at least a hundred movies a month. Or, I need to. Yeah. And to be honest, like before we even get on YouTube and, and try to talk about movies, we should have already seen every single movie ever made. Oh yeah. That's just the fact. Um, yeah. before you start a channel, you should have seen everything, you know, yeah. if you're going to talk you, about it. And, and you should have seen it when it came out theatrically originally. Yeah, I know exactly how the original color timing looks and everything. Ex exactly. Yeah. And you have and, to have seen, and you every, should have read the biography on every single movie and filmmaker. Yeah. And you the need to have behind the film. <laughs> every pre every previous home release, you have to have seen all of them so that you know how it used to look on those as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. That's just uh, a lesson for everybody out there. <laughs> yeah. Tip for everybody thinking about starting a channel. Of course, we're joking. Of course, we're joking. But Elliot, it was great having you on, man, to talk about. I feel like we hit on a lot of good points. I don't know if we dove into everything I wanted to today, but uh, we could save it for another time. Um, yeah. I hope after today, I didn't scare you away. You'd be willing to come back at some point uh, and do this thing again. Um but I appreciate you coming on real quick. If you want to promote yourself and your channel, let everybody know what you're all about over at 
boutique Blu-rays with Elliot Cohen. The floor is yours, sir. Yeah, so you can just find me at boutique Blu-rays, or if you just search my name, Elliot Cohen, it pops up. Uh, I talk about boutique Blu-rays and 4K discs and everything that's in this collection. Um, and you can find me on Instagram at Elliot Cohen Films as well. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, again, appreciate you having, uh, appreciate you coming on, me having you on. Um, everybody, if you haven't yet subscribed to Elliot, subscribe to his channel down below. His link will be down there and follow him on Instagram. Thank you all for watching this video. If you have any thoughts or comments on anything that we talked about here today, leave them down below. Like, subscribe, subscribe to everybody's channel. And uh, we'll see you guys later.